Hi, my name is Robert Stewart, a graduate from the Paleontology program at Carleton University. Everyone knows the age of dinosaurs ended when a meteor hit the Earth about 66 million years ago. But these guys didn't get the memo. Some dinosaurs survived the extinction and got right back to being terrifying giants like nothing ever happened. With a beak that could crack open a horse's skull in a top speed of 70 kilometers per hour, these terror birds took the idea of letting a meteor keep them down personally. For 135 million years, the top predator on every continent on Earth was a giant dinosaur. But 66 million years ago, that all changed. A gigantic asteroid collided with the Earth, hitting it with the force of four and a half billion atomic bombs. More than three quarters of all living things died out in the world of ashes left behind, including all of the giant dinosaurs. But not every dinosaur went extinct in the devastation. A family of flying dinosaurs adapted to eat small animals like insects survived the extinction event, and went on to become some of the most familiar animals on the planet, birds. After the extinction event, birds began to fill all kinds of places in the food web that used to be taken up by other dinosaurs. Parrots began to eat fruit, gulls began to eat fish, and some of them went all the way to the top of the food chain. A group called the Caryamiforms evolved killing claws on their toes, just like the now extinct raptor dinosaurs had, and began to fill in niches all over the world. 55 million years ago to 42 million years ago, four and five foot tall birds wielding these deadly raptor claws, like Eleutheronis of France and Switzerland, Paleocyloptaris of South America and Lavocatavis of North Africa occupied the role of medium-sized predators. Here in the jungles of the Eocene period, they lived in the shadow of giant terrestrial crocodiles like Titaniosuchus, Aremosuchus, and Barinosuchus, hunting smaller prey like snakes and lizards or early species of horses that grew to the size of rabbits. But some of them were already growing bigger. Just this year, Hooked toe claws from a caryamiform weighing as much as a person were found in Antarctica, where they would have occupied the top predator role in the warm forests of the Eocene South Pole. But about 42 million years ago, all of this began to change. The world began to cool, ice began to form over Antarctica, and the jungles that covered the rest of the world began to shrink. As they did, the range of these giant birds shrank with them. Entire families went extinct including all of the Cariama forms of Europe, Antarctica, and Africa. But the cooling event didn't last forever, and they took many of the giant crocodiles with them. In their aftermath, two great families of Cariama forms survived, and once the world began to warm up again, the two lineages of giant birds began to grow and thrive. In North America, a group called the Bathornids lived from the Eocene to the early Miocene, about 50 to 20 million years ago. Fossil remains of the Bathornids come from all over Wyoming and Dakota, as well as parts of Colorado and Nebraska. The Bathornids or their ancestors came to North America at the same time that other Cariamiforms were spreading through Africa and Europe, but the Bathornids survived the extinction event that wiped out their relatives and began to diversify about 37 million years ago. The earliest Bathornids, like Bathornis growlator, were only about three feet tall and they were light enough that some of them could probably still fly. But the name Bathornid means tall bird, and over the course of the next seven million years, they began to live up to the name. They grew from half a meter to one and a half meters, and then up to two meters tall, reaching sizes bigger than even an adult human. By the time of the late Oligocene, they were the biggest predators of their ecosystem, with Bathornis geographicus dominating wetland habitats and the related Paracrax gigantea dominating the savannas. These seven-foot giants grew so big that they lost the ability to fly, but being some of the biggest predators around, they didn't need to fly anymore. The biggest mammal predators in their ecosystem were around the same size as them, and the flightless giants were rivals and competitors to these early, distant relatives of cats and dogs, not prey. The smaller, flying species likely would have hunted lizards, frogs, and early rodent species like gophers and burrowing relatives of beavers, while the biggest bathornids could have preyed on animals as big as early camels and long-legged, skinny rhino relatives built like horses. Over in South America, even bigger birds were evolving in a group called the Forest Rockidae, which we call terror birds. 
Scientists break up the terror birds into two groups based on their skulls. Ones with longer, more slender skulls like Procramia and Siloteris likely hunted smaller prey like their ancestors. These skulls are called Silopteran type skull types, after one of the earliest and smallest members of the group. But as terror birds specialized and evolved, they developed specialized skulls called terror bird type skulls with thick, box-shaped heads that ended in long hooks that jutted out like a giant fang. Studies into how terror birds used these heavier terror bird type skulls show that they didn't use them like a mammal, biting down and shaking from side to side. Instead, they had thick muscle attachment sites at the back of the skull, which allowed them to bring it down like a hammer or an axe. Their bones here and around here were very fragile, meaning that they couldn't hold a sustained bite for very long. But the powerful bones in the back of the skull allowed them to crack open the bones of other animals, using it like a hammer to smash through bone and rip into muscles. And they had very strong skull uh, muscles here and here, which they could use to pull at meat and tear like a hook. With skulls like these, they were equipped to hunt creatures as big as deer or even horses. Their beaks weren't the only fearsome natural weapons that terror birds came equipped with. A trackway discovered just last year showed that they walked with their second toe claw elevated, and a look at these claws showed that they were thick and sharp like the claws of their extinct relatives, the raptor dinosaurs. This feature seems to have been found in ancient caryomiforms too, but in the giant terror birds it was very pronounced. They didn't just get stronger, but faster, too. A study from 2005 tested the forces a terror bird's leg bones could survive to measure just how fast a terror bird could run at max speed. Larger, heavier terror birds like Andagalornis were found to be able to reach top speeds of 70 kilometers per hour, about as fast as a car. But a two meter tall terror bird called Mesembryornis was found to be even faster, with f speeds as fast as 90 kilometers per hour proposed. Mesembryornis was a lanky bird, and specialized in smaller, faster prey that would have let it avoid competition with terrestrial crocodiles, marsupial saber-toothed mammals, and especially its many larger cousins. The largest of these other terror birds evolved about 15 million years ago in South America. Kellenken Gilermoy was a two and a half to three meter tall giant and weighed over a hundred kilograms, with an axe beak head the size of a human arm to match. Kellenken wasn't a slow, bulky animal, but a swift footed predator that could have run as fast as 50 kilometers per hour. Kellenken was a terror among the terror birds, living at the top of its ecosystem, but it wasn't the only giant of the time. The heaviest of the terror birds was a giant called Brontornis, which could weigh as much as 400 kilograms and had a thick, bulky body with blunt toes and a heavy beak. Brontornis was so bulky and slow that scientists still debate if it was a terror bird at all, or another type of giant herbivorous bird called a Gastornithiform. If it was a terror bird, it was big enough and heavily built enough to specialize in the slow, tough, and bulky herbivores of the time. The armored glyptodons and the giant ground sloths hadn't reached the gigantic sizes they would in 10 million years' time, instead being 1 to 2 meters long and lighter than Brontornis. Bigger animals like Pyrotherium that grew up to the size of a rhino had no long claws or thick armor to defend themselves. If it was a herbivore, Brontornis would have been potential prey for the giant Kellenken, and these two titanic dinosaurs could have clashed like their ancient relatives did some 50 million years before. Terror birds didn't just terrorize South America, though. In 1961, a pair of amateur archaeologists discovered the giant toe claws of a bird from the north of Florida. Two years later, paleontologists had an official description for North America's first terror bird, a two-meter-tall predator named Titanus. Originally, Titanus was thought to have crossed the land bridge that would become Mexico in the modern day some two and a half million years ago. A reassessment of the fossils, however, found that Titanus came to North America before a land bridge even existed. This gigantic bird, so big and heavy that it couldn't fly, swam across the ocean to reach the new continent. Here, 
Titanus was the biggest dedicated predator in its environment, dwarfing the cougar-sized saber-toothed cats and smaller wolves that existed at the time. Over the next two million years, Titanus spread and flourished, making its way from Florida to Texas, and then all the way to California. While terror birds and their bathorned cousins were fearsome predators, they had a weakness. Terror birds didn't start out as gigantic predators, but tiny eggs. These eggs were vulnerable to the cold spells and ice ages the planet has been experiencing for the past 40 million years. Eggs need to be kept much warmer than the live young that most mammals give birth to, since it's much warmer inside a mammal's body than in the nests outside that birds have to lay. If temperatures were too cold, the young terror birds would never hatch. So while the terror birds and the bathornids would spread their range and expand their niches during warm temperatures, they started to die out as the world grew colder and colder. The bathornids died out 32 million years ago, during a cooling event in the early Miocene, while the giant terror birds died out during the start of the Ice Ages, around 1.8 million years ago. There's evidence some of the smaller terror birds held out until as recently as 10,000 years ago in the warmest parts of South America, like Uruguay, but they too died out in the last Ice Age, one of the coldest periods in the entire history of the Earth. But while the terror birds and their bathornid cousins from the north no longer exist today, they do have some relatives who still do. The Surima birds of South America live in much the same way the smallest of the terror birds lived for 55 million years, hunting snakes and rodents on the plains of South America and using their giant toe claws to cut their prey to pieces. Found all over Brazil and Argentina's grasslands, these little terrors grow only to two to three feet tall, shorter than even their oldest ancestors. But even as their giant relatives were dying out, a new group of animals was evolving and spreading all over the world. Humans. These humans also like to live in warm environments with lots of clear, open space, and as they spread around the world, they began to change their environment to match their needs. In modern-day South America, humans continue to clear the rainforests and warm the world with fossil fuels which has only made these last of the terror birds' ancient family more common and widespread. As we wipe out predators like jaguars and cougars that might compete with these birds, we might yet be paving the way for a new golden age of the terror birds ourselves, without even realizing it. <laughs>